Here we are, and I'm admitting everybody. Morning, everybody. Hello, Morning. can everybody hear us? Just thumbs up. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Susan, and I'm so happy to see everyone online today, and thank you for being with us. I uh, just admitting everyone here, but as we go along, I'm meeting everybody, I, admitting everybody, sorry. And uh, I want to introduce two ladies who is going to be with us today. First, I'm going to introduce Meg, and then she's going to introduce Alicia. Meg and Alicia are from City Osteopath Physio and will be our teachers this morning. So Meg, take it over. Great. Do we want to, and how do we, do we want to kick off now or give everyone a couple of um, I think because we have a lot of things to catch up on, we'll just kick on and then uh, I'll let everyone in as they come in. So you, okay. just, you just start. Sounds good. Well, hi, everyone. Um, as talked, uh, Alicia and I are from City Osteophysio. Um, this is our second talk with Expat Living, and um, we've actually run a couple of other talks outside. So um, first, I guess, maybe a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, we always find that there's loads of questions and we really want to answer your questions. Um, we will generally what's best is we'll do the questions at the end, but there is a chat. So please, as soon as you think of a question as Alicia's going through it, you know, ping your question over in the chat and we will be, you know, looking at them and collating them. And then um, we will go through kind of the big questions at the end. We also often get a lot of specific questions. You know, um, I'm taking this thing. Is this the right thing for me? Those specific questions, um, we will. We always do a follow-up email afterwards. So there's often a lot of people who have the same questions. So we will note those down, and um, we will follow up. You know, today, tomorrow, the next day with an email. Um, so yes, I guess you know how we got to this talk. So Alicia and I were just brainstorming, and um, just before Christmas and the New Year, and January is a time that I know a lot of us are looking. You know, how do we reset? How do we get our health back? on a great trajectory for the new year. So, um, you know, our bodies are amazing things and how they kind of can heal themselves. So uh, I am not the expert, but um, for me as a lay woman, it sounded like a really, really interesting topic. So I will now hand over to Alicia, um, take it away. Thank you so much, Meg and Susan. Um, it's great to be back for another webinar and to share um, what we do at City Osteo in the clinic in the naturopathic um, section. So just a little bit about my background. Um, as mentioned, I work as a naturopath at City Osteo and Physio. My background is in preventative medicine. Um, I've been qualified as a naturopath um, for the last 15 years and exploring all the wonders of health and science in this space. So it's an ongoing process, as I'm sure many of you who are in this field um, can relate to so today, as Meg uh, spoke about previously, the presentation that we're going to be talking about is nutrient therapy. And for most of you, it's likely that you're joining today because you have a genuine interest in health and you're looking for ways to improve your well-being. And, you know, at the start of the year is ultimately the place and the time that we're looking at re resetting our goals for the year ahead. And one thing that I see time and time in the clinic that is extremely helpful um, is actually looking at nutrient deficiencies. Um, and I've put this webinar together to address this really common issue. Um, one, it can be really easily fixed given the right environment. And I've seen a world of difference in to many patients' health, just from this simply looking at our nutrient load and our diet and nutrition. So, um, Today, we're going to be talking about how to identify nutrient deficiencies, tips on clinical signs from a naturopathic point of view, uh, what is nutrient therapy, and how can we personalize nutrient therapy? How would we actually do this from a naturopathic point of view? So some of you might be thinking right now, so what is naturopathic medicine then? Well, let me quickly explain for those who may not be familiar, but I would best describe naturopathic medicine as preventative uh, healthcare um, that looks at the why. So really what we're looking at doing is why does this person have the health, health issues that they have? 
and what is the underlying mechanisms that could be in causing this imbalance for that particular person. So, you know, from a naturopathic point of view, uh, a person may present with migraines. Um, but what we're actually looking at here is not just looking at this as a diagnosis, but looking at why is this person actually experiencing this? And migraines is one perfect example where nutrient therapy can do the world of good. Um, but one thing that I would also say each time is that um, I know for sure that migraines are not a Panadol deficiency. So, you know, we're really looking at what's behind. It's not just about giving a medication, but what else is actually behind that? So nutrient deficiencies, you know, when I was looking into this, because I'm seeing it so often in the clinic, um, you know, even digging a little bit deeper and doing a bit more research, you know, it, it just amazes me how big this number actually is of people that have, um, you know, deficiencies in our essential micronutrients, like our essential vitamins and minerals. Um, and the issue I think is, is that often, you know, these nutrient deficiencies can build over quite a long period of time. And it just leaves people kind of not feeling right for quite some time. And then it just slowly kind of gets worse for most people. So, um, you know, this often is like kind of where it's hard for people to know where to start on their path to get better because it's, it's just like gradually happening over time. But what I would say is my advice, my advice is quite simple. I always like to start with nutrient um, deficiencies and nutrient therapy because it helps to build a solid foundation for someone. So my advice is, you know, when we're starting off at the start of the year with trying to help with our health, um, stabilizing these essential nutrients, you know, looking at the vitamins and minerals can really help us to feel better quicker. And even if there is something deeper going on, uh, say, for example, the person has severe digestive issues um, or hormonal imbalance, the, helping with the nutrient deficiencies often gives the individual enough of a kickstart to feel that little bit better so that it's not so overwhelming for them um, to kind of continue on their health journey. So, um, you know, one thing to note, and I know it might sound quite obvious for some people, but it is, you know, with nutrient therapies, it does go hand in hand with chronic illness. So often people that are chronically sick will have multiple array of um, nutrients that are out of balance. And, you know, when I'm talking about nutrients, I'm talking about things like folate, iron, magnesium, vitamins A, D, K, B, B12. Um, you know, they all play a crucial role in our health. Um, one thing I would say to, um, to everyone is that, you know, our recommended daily allowances that have been set to ensure that we're getting all these adequate micronutrients. Um, they're only set, the RDAs are set at like two standard deviations of what would cause death in a mouse. So, um, you know, we really wanna to try to set the bar a lot higher um, because there's a lot of like many subclinical effects from even lower ranges of nutrients that can cause damage to our health. Um, yeah, and this can often be brushed off as feeling tired or a brain fog or just ex excessive sugar cravings, this type of thing. So, um, you know, I, what we're left with today is more of a silent kind of epidemic emerging. And there has been research into this sector, but you know, what, what uh, the index that you're actually looking at on, on your screen right now, it's called the hidden hunger index. And it's where, um, people who have enough food are still malnourished of essential vitamins and minerals. Um, and so you can see from the index here that there's about uh, 2 billion people worldwide. Um, but I actually think the number is a lot higher um, than what they're estimating. And this index um, is based purely on not all of our micronutrients. It's only based on zinc, um, iron and vitamin A levels and in children under five years. So we can see that, I mean, often what we would normally talk about is that these types of issues are more in like the elderly populations and, you know, maybe in, um, you know, countries where there's not enough food, but, you know, basically my point here that I'm trying to make is that even when we, we are lucky enough to have an array of healthy vegetables and, you know, dietary wise, and, you know, we're, um, we have enough food, there's still this issue of malnourishment as far as not having enough of the essential vitamins and minerals.
So what I just wanted to have a look at now is just kind of um, explain to people like how would these nutrient deficiencies normally be detected then? Okay. So as I was saying before, like nutrient deficiencies are often overlooked and undetected for years. Um, and one reason for that can be related back to our, the way that we interpret blood tests. Um, typically the gold standard for testing is through, um, through a blood test for most of our vitamins and minerals. However, what's happening is, is that as a community, as we're getting sicker and sicker, what we call normal is actually changing with it. So the new normal these days is actually being quite multi-symptomatic in kind of like symptoms and um, illnesses that we have and the different intensity of these symptoms that being multi-symptomatic brings. Um, and obviously a lot of this can be tied back to our diets. Our diets are more high in inflammatory foods and sugars and fats, salt, all the nice foods, you know, are quite normally high in salt and, um, or sugar. Um, and our lab work is naturally reflecting this. So what's happening is, is like the blood sugar levels, inflammatory markers, thyroid markers are now set higher amongst others um, because the lab results are getting a um, reference range from the, um, the, the norm of the general population. So this makes us, you know, this makes feeling less vibrant, the new normal, as, like our, as our health kind of slowly deteriorates. We're creating this new standard of, of health. And, you know, the issue here is, is that, you know, this is like saying, well, I don't have cancer, so I'm, you know, I'm healthy. Um, but at the same time, I've gotten, you know, I wake up feeling severely sore in my joints. You know, I'm getting chronic sinus, extreme period pain each month. And every time I eat, I get loose bowel movements. Like that isn't, that isn't healthy either. Um, but often then when we go to have blood tests, we can fall into this kind of these reference ranges that quite simply you could drive a truck through, like they're really big. Um, and this leaves uh, patients often, you know, being within this reference range, but still experiencing symptoms. Um, and, you know, as that little cartoon is showing, borderline results can often be overlooked as well. So, you know, I guess the one thing from a naturopathic point of view when we're looking at things holistically is, is that it's really important then to be your own healthcare practitioner and to really learn to read your own body. Like, what is your body actually saying to you? Paying attention to you because often, like, your body will tell you a lot more than what will come back on any kind of lab testing. Like, lab tests aren't, can't be 100% accurate. So from a naturopathic point of view, um, what, what we can actually look at, the holistic approach looks at advocating the importance of listening to your body and what is it trying to tell you. Some people feel like, oh, I can't tell anything at all. My body doesn't tell me anything. But it's, it's, it's just over time slowly developing this relationship because we just need to be patient and just know that no sign is too small. Um, and we also just need to be patient and remember that we have these symptoms for a very good reason. Um, for, for us as an individual, as a patient, they help us to understand the unique way our body presents um, when we get sick, because even when we're sick and we might have the same diagnosis as someone, for example, you know, going back to that migraine diagnosis, the actual way that we present and the way that we feel sick could be completely different in the lead up to that, or even when we're experiencing the migraine. Um, so, and, you know, from a practitioner point of view, I love having patients that really listen to their body and they can give me lots of detail because it helps me to be able to work um, a lot more efficiently. And from, from these symptoms that the patient is telling me as well, it allows me to prioritize the treatment strategy and also give, gives me further clues into contributing to, you know, what could be underlying for that person in that, ov in that overall imbalance. So from here, I'd like to share with you some tips, okay, just for people to help get them started on the language of our body. And this is going to be tied back to what we're talking about today, which is nutrient 
um, deficiencies. So this is just a foundation of um, different signs and symptoms from what we would call like a clinical presentation um, in different nutrient deficiencies. It's not something that we would diagnose from straight away. You would then use a blood test to look at a diagnosis. Um, okay, but just consider this your warning, okay, because if you're eating morning tea right now, and I'm sorry, my presentation seemed to do this to people, but um, what I wanted to say was these are some pictures of bodily signs, but to make it, uh, to show people, this is more when the body is screaming, because our body will start off by whispering and say, by giving us little symptoms, but then as you don't listen, it will start to scream. So just a, just a FYI to stop eating. Okay. So these are common nutrient deficiencies, okay, um, that can occur. And um, B12 is, um, is quite a common nutrient deficiency. So I've just put on the slide there. These are some like clinical presentations or signs in the body without even having a blood test that could lead you to suspect B12 deficiency. And uh, I'm going to come back to the iris. So FYI, it doesn't mean if you've got blue eyes, you're going to have B12 deficiency, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but, you know, what is B12 deficiency? It's just simply, um, it's a type of anemia um, or a condition that which affects um, our healthy red blood cells due to a lack of vitamin B12. Um, so some of the more serious effects of B12 deficiency can actually be nerve damage. So, um, and when it gets to that particular point, it can be irreversible. So it is important to act quickly if you're feeling like, um, you know, neurological type symptoms, like tingling and things like that. Um, but often for B12, it can just uh, present as fatigue, um, which most of us feel tired most of the time. So it can be quite a very generalized um, symptom to have. But um, B12 is yeah, very common. You know, one study from Tufts University showed that 40% of people between the ages of actually 26, so very young to 83, um, have plasma, uh, plasma B12 levels in the low range. And, and this is a range that many people will actually experience these neurological symptoms. 9% um, had an outright nutrient deficiency, so extremely low, and 16% had a knee deficiency. Um, but some of the most surprising um, results out of that research was the fact that low B12 levels were as common in younger people as it was in the elderly. Um, so that is just something to be mindful of as well. So back to that blue iris on the screen. So naturopaths do use um, iridology. It's Again, it's not as a diagnosis. You wouldn't um, diagnose someone from looking at their eyes, but um, I do find iridology absolutely fascinating. If I have a individual in front of me um, I always take into consideration the signs on their but like that their body might be showing like fingernails tongue but from an iris point of view um, what I'm looking at here is you can see the black pupil and then the gray that's directly around the inner of that black pupil um, is what's reflective of the digestive system and this is what we're looking at as someone's like general constitution that they have a blue iris but um, if it gets quite gray where that black pupil is, then it is associated with low hydrochloric acid in the stomach or a tendency to have like low stomach acid. Okay, so that can, and we need the stomach acid to actually absorb vitamin B12. So that's just like, these are signs, like these are the ways from a holistic, that's just a um, example from a holistic point of view of how we could then go, okay, that would, that would be another piece of the puzzle that would make me think, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, but it doesn't mean that if you have blue eyes, you have uh, B12 deficiency. Okay, so let's go on to another one, iron. Um, iron deficiency also is very common, especially in women. Um, so clinically, we can look for side, um, signs of tiredness, headaches, pale skin, which of course is another sign that's not necessarily going to be um, relatable for everyone. Um, but um, dark circles under the eyes can be another uh, you know, sign of low iron. The normal labs, like when we're looking at iron on lab results, the normal reference range is 30 to 100. So it's a really wide scope that we're looking at here. Like there's many symptoms that can occur if you're say 50 compared to 
like under, which is 10. So, you know, there's, there's many symptoms that can happen when you even like say, okay, you're great. You're within the reference range. Um, and probably one of the most annoying is hair fall. So, you know, loss of hair, um, you know, when it gets severely bad, it can be headaches and dizziness and, you know, all of this. But in general, I would say, you know, even just looking at it, because we're looking, when we're looking at this from a naturopathic point of view, we're looking at it from a preventative medicine, that we need iron to help with making cellular energy, what we call our mitochondria. So we need it to make energy within the body. Um, and having low levels of iron can really affect our thyroid function and um, that, you know, affects our metabolism. You can see how the knock-on effect um, grows from there and so the signs here can be a very pale tongue pale skin um, and you know pale you can check under your eyelids here pale under the eyelids there can be some signs to indicate and just if you're extremely tired and your hair's falling out these are all signs zinc um, is often one that's overlooked actually and zinc is probably one of my favorite minerals it is um, it's a part of so many different enzymatic processes throughout the body. Um, they're saying roughly around 2000 different enzymes will use zinc in the body. So it's very far reaching, multi-talented zinc. Um, so, you know, it's used predominantly um, in the immune response. So, you know, to help water viruses and colds and flus. Um, but also if your skin just takes ages to heal, like if you go, if you knock a wound or you go to pick a pimple or something like that and you end up with a um you know it just takes forever to heal over it can be that you're really low in zinc um and actually we need a lot of zinc for our taste buds um so um so often if we can't taste anything um or if, if, if food is tasting bland and this can lead to fussy eating and actually so can iron lead to fussy eating but they're coming from different pathways so for zinc, it's more to do with the actual taste buds. So having zinc um, is really important. And, you know, one sign that you could all do and have a look at now is looking at that uh, white spots on your nails. Um, that is actually quite a good indicator. It may not always be 100% zinc, I found, like with the white spots on the nails. Sometimes it can be when we've gone through like a really tough period of stress or that could even just be stress from being sick, like a lot of oxidative stress on the body can also um, show those zinc signs as well. And, um, you know, in parallel, that will also burn through our zinc. And stretch marks, if you get stretch marks very easily. I know stretch marks are normal part of um, life, but also if it is that you're getting um you know really deep stretch marks you know um i would look at zinc levels as well so zinc is normally it's easier like to try to boost up zinc we, we would normally take it in a supplement form the forms of zinc like the foods that are high in zinc are um quite obscure foods so things like oysters or pepitas um, and you would have to eat quite a lot of it to be able to get like a therapeutic amount so you know normally a form of zinc that i recommend is a citrate form um, or um, gluconate form of zinc um, and i would always look at um, you know the person's uh, blood results as well because with zinc it is something that you can actually overdo you don't want to just keep taking it you want to get it to an optimal level and then um, maintain it through the diet but, um, you know, if the, the person is low, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 milligrams for an adult. Um, and one thing, one tip that I will give you about zinc is always take it with a meal because if you have zinc on an empty stomach, it will make you feel nauseous, regardless of the brand. Um, okay, magnesium is another um, one that is extremely common as far as nutrient deficiencies. Um, so with uh, magnesium what I would say is um, it's very much uh, used in our energy pathway so if you're exercising a lot and you get a stitch when you exercise um, it may be a good idea to look into magnesium and um, vitamin b6 and zinc actually um, because these are the nutrients that um, that when they're low they're a sign of like poor energy production in the cells so that can actually help us with um with you know exercising as well um, magnesium you can take in lots of different forms um, you know transdermal so on the skin but epsom salt baths are especially great for kids um, and so it doesn't necessarily need to be taken in a supplement form 
Uh, so, you know, for Epsom salts um, for a bath, you could add like half to one cup full of Epsom salts in the bathtub. And that helps with um, detoxification. It helps with our sulfation metabolism. Like it helps with um, increasing sulfur content in the body. Um, just be careful that they don't drink the bath water though, because it will cause diarrhea if they're drinking the bath water and there's Epsom salts in there. Um, and if the Epsom salts is a little bit drying on the skin, you could add a little bit of bicarb in there as well. So that's just some other tips and tricks of not necessarily taking a supplement if you're not too low, um, could also boost it up. Okay, so I just wanted to show you this, like that, those ones that we just spoke about are very common nutrient deficiencies. So often uh, for most people, you know, you can look at giving those nutrients and they will help the person. It'll help tremendously just with overall energy levels and just with having a healthier diet, et cetera, et cetera. But for some nutrient deficiencies that aren't always obvious signs. And so, you know, with folic acid, I just, I came across this research um, that was one study um, that compared radiation to folic acid in human cells. And so what it was showing was is that the more exposure to x-rays, the more chromosomes in our DNA that we break. And it's comparative to having, like the less folic acid that we have, the more chromosomes that we break. So I just wanted to show you that like having a folate deficiency, they're comparing that to having radiation damage. So, you know, folic acid is actually something that we would get from eating our green leafy vegetables. Um, so, you know, making sure that we're having a healthy diet can really protect our cells from DNA damage. And, um, you know, we might not always necessarily have these signs, but it's showing you the importance of making sure that we're starting from a foundation and getting all of like these essential nutrients to begin with. So nutrient therapy, it's very simple. Um, it's just determining, uh, it's, it's determined through using biochemical testing and um, the clinical analysis, some which we've just gone through. I mean, there are other vitamins and minerals, but in this, you know, in the, to try to save time and not to bore you all to death. Like they're just a quick uh, summary of, of some of the, the main ones that I see. Um, and then the treatment would involve replacing the nutrients that are found to be defi de um, deficient. Um, but the point here is that it needs to be in a therapeutic potency. Um, and this usually involves supplementation at the right potency for the right amount of time. So it's not ongoing and using the most absorbable method tailored for that individual. Um, if, you know, for some people, if they're um, needing quite a lot of it, they're low in omega-3s um, and they're not getting enough of it through their diet and they're getting signs and symptoms of being quite inflamed and needing those omega-3s. Um, if we, as a naturopathic point of view, we always look at um, nutrition and diet and lifestyle and how that would play a factor on that. But also to begin with and to try to help bridge people, especially if they're feeling quite exhausted or tired, the supplement form is an easy way to try to bridge them to help them to feel quicker, better. Because if you were trying to get enough omega-3s, you could eat, say, about 1.23 kilos of snapper or 1.1 kilos of tuna every day. Or you could take like a one teaspoon, uh, five mils of like a high omega-3 fish oil liquid um, for a certain amount of time. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And, you know, if we're looking at this in children, looking at trying to boost up their nutrients, it would, it would be impossible to try to get them to eat certain amounts of food in this sometimes twice a day. Um, you know, you would lose your hair. So uh, some of these things are just to help for a certain period of time to help with that crossover, um, to work you know, in combination with dietary and lifestyle support. Um, but the one key thing that I will say is even when we are giving supplements, it's, it's not the be all and end all, like to be able to um, make sure that the supplements uh, can, can work their best, we need to make sure that we put the effort in as far as like the lifestyle and diet side of things as well. Otherwise, even the supplements won't work. I often get a lot of people say to me, well, you know, can't we just get all of this through food? Um, I would always say it's a good idea to keep an eye on what your vitamins and minerals are doing. And obviously it comes down to everyone's individual lifestyle and health to begin with. 
but I'm sure most of you have seen this time and time again that you know with the amount of pesticides that are used like glycophosphate is used on more than 70 different food crops these days including a lot of the ones that we eat on repeat like corn and soy and wheat um, and you know glycophosphate that particular uh, pesticide is linked to serious health risks including like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma so you know it's we just need to be um, mindful of um, the fact that our food isn't what it used to be that's that's the main point that I'm trying to make here and and also the fact that um, you know living in Singapore there's little farming land and that we import over 90 percent of our food consumed so this automatically impacts on the, even when we are eating the right foods, um, the freshness and you know the the amount of time that the nutrients are, are available in the food, and also too just the increased cost of food, and then those a lot of the different fruit and vegetables. Like the best way to have is a higher like a, a big diversity of lots of different vegetables, um, but you know for many it can come down to cost as well, so that can be an issue for some. Um, so. It's not just, you know, the fact of not eating too many junk foods or processed foods in our diet. Um, but obviously, like stress and that, that will all contribute to it as well. The other thing I wanted to touch on is that um, a lot a lot of different pharmaceutical drugs will actually also deplete vitamins and minerals. And I'm very pro-medicine, so it's not about going off of any medications or anything like that. But this is just um to, you know food for thought so to speak and you know i was looking at the top sales of um medications from 2019 it's just interesting to see what what are the most selling medications and you know a lot of these top medications that are selling um all chronic diseases you know that are linked a lot of them to cancer and autoimmune disease that's happening um and so, you know, when we look at these numbers, like 19.73 billion, that's a lot of money. And, um, you know, this is, this is money that if we can invest more into our preventative health care, it is money well spent rather than doing it the back, from the backwards direction. Um, so, yeah, a lot of these are immunosuppressive, um, autoimmune type diseases. Um, you know, so we want to really look after the immune system when we're looking at this and look at what nutrient deficiencies are actually being depleted by these medications so um i don't know that so there's a medication ppis um that are used very commonly for like reflux um and gerd and these have been shown um to increase actually a lot of vitamin and mineral deficiencies including b12 and um vitamin c and calcium and iron um, in the body and this is because the mechanism of action is looking at reducing the stomach acid in the body uh, so this is just something to consider I mean normally PPIs are and I'm not a doctor so um, just a disclaimer it's always something that you would chat with your doctor about but normally they're recommended for a period of time but it is something to consider if you have been on you know, a PPI for a period of time to actually have a look at your B12 and your vitamins and see what's actually going on there. Um, yeah, because a lack of stomach acid and, um, you know, stomach inflammation allows for overgrowth of bacteria in the, in the gut. And um, this actually competes with um, the host for the consumption of B12. And um, this is also commonly the issue for many people with digestive issues like SIBO and... Um, so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, oral contraceptives is another one to keep an eye on. I would always recommend a really good um, multivitamin um, with all your Bs in there, like B6 is really important. Um, if you're on the oral contraceptive pill, just to make sure you're getting all those, the extra nutrients that you would need on top of a good diet or the RDAs. Um, so, you know, having something like that is just food for thought would be very helpful if you're on the, um, choose to take the oral contraceptive pill from a nutrient point of view. Um, okay. And cholesterol lowering medication. So um, it is pretty widely accepted now that um, a lot of cardiologists will consider um, supplementing with a antioxidant nutrient called coenzyme Q10. 
So coenzyme Q10 is, um, or ubiquinol, which you can see there is the second one from the top, is actually the activated version of coenzyme Q10. And um, ubiquinol's role is in heart health is based on playing, um, it helps with cellular energy needed to power the heart. So <laughs> extremely important. Um, and it is the active form of coenzyme Q10, a very powerful um, antioxidant. But supplementing with ubiquinol can be very helpful in, in balancing um, uh, toxins or oxid oxidative stress on the body. And it helps to protect the cells from free radical damage and helping to neutralize bad LDL cholesterol in the body as well. Um, and a doctor that, or I should say cardiologist, um, that has so much information, um, it's gold, on coenzyme Q10 and ubiquinol. If you're interested in this space is Dr. Ross um, Walker. So you should look him up and um, he works a lot in like the preventative cardiology space. Um, and he talks a lot about ubiquinol. Um, and just the other thing to note here from a naturopathic point of view is that genetically, okay, so we would take into consideration um, uh, uh, someone's genetics. So some people genetically have issues with converting the coenzyme Q10, which is a non-activated form, to the active form of ubiquinol. So I always actually, just a little tip, I always recommend that people take the active form, of, which is ubiquinol, not coenzyme Q10, which is probably more commonly found, like in from a retail point of view, um, just to override this conversion, um, just in case if you haven't looked at your DNA before. Um, okay, so this is just to give you um, some more examples. So with steroids, so again, my main point here is just to look at, to monitor, to monitor um, nutrient levels to ensure that, you know, you're getting enough of your good quality multis and it's not zapping you too much of your nutrients and um, you're getting, you know, nutrient dense foods. Um, you know, if we're looking at things like, you know, B12, you know, organic, liver pate or something like that, even though some people might want to vomit just hearing that. But these are these are the types of foods that are extremely high in nutrients or, you know, your fresh leafy greens and, um, you know, fresh spirulina, that type of thing. Anti-diabetic medication, I would particularly look at from a vitamin D point of view and a B12 and calcium, make sure that they're okay. And if someone's on antidepressants, I would be definitely checking for vitamin D um, as well. And that's just one more example. So, um, you know, looking at iron and vitamin C. So, you know, this is just showing you like all of the different things that we need to keep in mind when we're looking at just the first step of a foundation building up our nutrients. And, you know, um, because we're looking at this from a naturopathic point of view, what are some tips to actually avoid these nutrient deficiencies in the first place? And I would have to say time and time again that this is simply the issue of trying not to self-medicate. And, you know, you may be thinking, what is she talking about? Like self-medicating. What I mean by this is kind of the things that we use as crutches um, or certain habits to get through the day. So, um, you know, this can be very vague across the board. So we can, very, we can be very creative and unique how we kind of get through the day sometimes when there's stress. But um, this link down the bottom there, that reference is, um, it was a survey presented by the BBC that highlighted that UK 11 year olds were actually using uh, smoking energy drinks and junk food to deal with the stress they were feeling about the um, SATs exams, which is a national test to regulate educational standards. Um, and it places pressure on the school for the students to do well. So um, you know, that's why I'm saying like this can be from all ages. And, you know, you could probably think like, why is video gaming on there? How can that deplete your nutrients? Well, very simply, if you're inside all day playing a video game, you're not getting any vitamin D for one. So I can think of that straight away. If you're stressed out because you're, uh, it's just things basically to numb your body. And when we numb our body, we're running on a different type of energy. It's we're disconnected from our bodies. And that runs on a different type of energy and we burn more vitamins and nutrients from a functional point of view. So, um, so it's tried from a lifestyle point of view, if we can work with the lifestyle things first and then try to bring the dietary things in, 
it is so much easier. If we just say, okay, no, it, we just look at the nutrients and I'm just going to make sure that I eat, you know, um, this amount of spinach or, you know, um, but then we feel very stressed and we're using tea and coffee and all of these other things, then um, from an emotional point of view, we're kind of, it's just a roller coaster and that can make us very manic as well. So it's about doing it in a certain quality of energy and starting with lifestyle as well, you know, because if we feel more sad, we're going to medicate and we're going to eat more, maybe more chocolate. And then as the day goes on alcohol and then maybe cheese, and then maybe we're having all three. And then the next day we feel tired. So then coffee creeps in to be able to function the next day, as well as the, you know, as well as the other things. And so, yeah, so it's just about having that purpose in life and, and having a look at the food choices as a secondary thing, like what's going on underneath of the food choices, I guess is what I'm trying to present there. So the personalized approach, um, let's have a closer look at, you know, how we can actually put all of this together, like what we've been talking about. So the personalized approach, what we would look at, it's based on the individual biochemistry of each patient. So what we would look at from that is um, the clinical presentation of how someone is coming into the clinic, plus maybe the blood work um, that they've had, um, obviously their main health concerns or goals. Um, for some people, it may be if they've had like uh, quite a chronic illness, it may be extremely helpful to look at their genetics if they're having an ongoing issue. Um, we would be looking at lifestyle as well. Um, and, you know, with the looking at like the individual biochemistry, um, so as well as the bloods and the DNA testing, there's actually a urine test that you can do. Um, and some of you may be familiar with it. It's been around for quite some time now, but it's called the organic acids test. And it shows us a, a, a metabolic snapshot of what is going on in the body. And it includes 76 urinary metabolites. Um, so it's quite a wide scope and it can help us not just with nutrient deficiencies, um, but also, you know, looking at neurotransmitter health and um, there's markers in there for digestive function and candida or yeast. Um, so, and, and the way that we absorb uh, essential fatty acids. So there's that in, um, you know, in combination with the blood test can actually be a really good combination um, to get a better scope of what could be going on as well in other areas and not just the nutrient deficiencies. Um, and then as I was saying, like the DNA helps to establish um, well, can, especially if people having got ongoing issues, can help to establish the most absorbable forms and also common uh, biochemical tend tendencies for that particular person. Um, and not all testing is required for everyone. And, and that's why we call it a personalized approach. So it just depends on the person's concerns and you know, wishes and working in together with that, um, you know, to create a solid foundation for them. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about like the, um, this particular part, which is looking more at the genetic predisposition that some people might find interesting. Um, you know, one thing that I must stress is that our genes, uh, and you may have heard this, but our genes are not our destiny and, um, you know, our health care outcomes are only, can only 10% be related back to our genes. So, you know, that last slide that we were talking about, like I was talking about not self-medicating with trying to get through the day, that's 90%. Like that part is huge. So if you can get that under control, you're, you're nearly all the way there. Um, but for some people genetically, it can be very helpful to look at, um, at their DNA. Um, and so, you know, for example, like when, when we're looking at the DNA, um, if someone has had a reoccurring problem with, you know, low B12 levels. Um, there is a gene that, or two genes actually, that we can look at. It's called MTRR and MTR. And both of these genes are connected to B12 metabolism. Um, and what it's actually looking at is if we have like a, a common SNP on these genes or a, what we call a mutation on the MTRR or MTR, um, that can be measured with a DNA test um, because what we're actually looking at is the way that it impacts B12 metabolism and um, it can indicate a greater need for B12, like actually needing more B12 supplementation 
um, if you have a polymorphism in those genes. So a genetic profile report looks at all of these common genetic mutations. Um, and what simply what it is, is, is that it's, um, it's looking at genetic variations that may influence the way that our body functions. That's it. And it's how it responds to what you eat, how you exercise and how you metabolize certain essential vitamins and nutrients, such as the B12 example that I just gave you. Um, so that, that's the genetic side of things with that. And it can also look at the um, different biochemical tendency. So what I mean by that is it can look at and identify if someone is, has a tendency towards a state of chronic inflammation in the body. Um, because what we tend to see is, is that because most people aren't living 100% a healthy life, you know, a person's biochemical tendencies, you know, due to this modern day living tends to persist throughout our life. Um, so, you know, if we're looking at, say, for example, we're looking at doing a DNA test and we can see they have a lot of genetic um, tendency towards being chronically inflamed. I mean, I mean, inflammation is not a negative thing. It's just when it is um, persistent and it is not in a balanced, uh, normal rhythm, um, then, you know, then we would then tailor uh, the types of nutrients that we would look at to begin with. So this is just like an outline of, okay, if you had a tendency towards chronic inflammation, any one of these kind of conditions, just depending on if there's a tendency there, these are all things that have uh, a large potential for inflammation behind it. Um, and there's, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a, a certain nutrient deficiency, but, you know, we would definitely focus on, um, you know, the nutrients that help with reducing inflammation. And that could be the omega-3s, definitely vitamin D. Um, you know, genetically, vitamin D helps to regulate over 900 different genes in the body. So that's huge just with that one alone. Magnesium is very alkalizing. So we would look at that one as well, um, you know, and further to, to that, um, to that kind of investigations, we would look at, you know, further treatment to deal with specific underlying causes that could be triggering the inflammation, like chronic infection or gut imbalances or allergies, poor lifestyle or sleep, um, mitochondrial dysfunction. All this is, is just the fact that the person is having issues with energy production in the body. So this is different ways that could come out with poor energy delivery mechanisms in the body. Um, and simply our mitochondria are the energy factories of our body and it's all about producing energy. So, you know, if we looked at the DNA and we could see that there was um, a lot of genetic SNPs in this particular pathway, we would also look at things like ubiquinol, which, which I was talking about prior before, and see it would help us to, to trace back into a particular area. Oxidative stress is another uh, key area. This looks at our antioxidant systems in the body to help with mopping up any kind of free radical damage. Um, and these are the types of um, illnesses that are linked back to um, uh, having a high amount of oxidative stress. Um, so, I mean, ideally, we don't, we want to make sure all of this is functioning regardless, but just um, so that we're not taking giant bags full of like supplements and like trying to take every single health thing under the sun um, and driving ourselves absolutely batty, we could look, okay, so what is it for me individually? Am I able to convert these nutrients into the active form? You know, Ed, you know, should I be focusing predominantly on um, mitochondrial support or, you know, this, that? So it helps us with long-term health because our genes never change. I should probably just add that as well. So our genes will never change. It's a once-off DNA test. Um, it's working with epigenetics to work, how, uh, to, to work in with how food and certain nutrients can actually interact or communicate with our genes. Um, Okay, so putting it all together, um, that DNA test that I was just talking about is a once-off uh, test. It's just an easy saliva test um, and the organic acids test, which is um, the urine sample. And then uh, there's a nutrient deficiency, which is a blood draw. And as I was saying before, like all the tests aren't necessarily required, um, but this gives us quite a good profile of, um, you know, looking at and summarizing 
And um, it really depends on what the main health concern is for that particular individual as well and kind of what their goals are. Because also too, you know, maybe a stool analysis or something like that could be more important for one person, you know, rather than, you know, looking at a DNA test for them. Um, uh, but what I would say, you know, for 2021 ahead, you know, simply looking at um, starting off with nutrient deficiencies is my main point here. Um, and, you know, making sure that we can cross correlate that with nutrition and also getting the right amounts in the right forms um, is a great way to actually help with just feeling more energetic and, you know, getting back onto the path um, of better vibrancy. Um, so what I wanted to offer today is we have a special promotion um, for 20% off initial and one hour appointments. So the one hour appointments for people that have um, come into the clinic before um, and are returning and um, just on mention of the webinar when you go to book. Um, so you can simply call us at the clinic there at Guthrie House, we're lo located, or email reception at cityosteophysio.com. Um, I would absolutely love to see you all. Um, and I guess with that, uh, it's probably enough of me talking. <laughs> um, we can open it up for any questions or anything that anyone may have. I think Meg, will you start the questions? Yes, why don't I? We've had some great questions come in. Um, mm. There was actually a few around absorption. Um, yeah. you know, one around, is there a difference in nutrient absorption between supplements and food? Yes. And then um, kind of related to that, how much does poor absorption play into what you're talking about? You know, is a nutrient, can a nutrient deficiency be an absorption issue versus an availability issue? Yes, I would say both. And this is kind of why I wanted to mention, even though sometimes the genetic side of things can be a little bit uh, convoluted. That's why I kind of wanted to mention from, from a genetic point of view that can also hinder absorption. So depending on our genetic tendencies um, and if, those, if we're not living a healthy lifestyle, if those genes are triggered, then we're not absorbing already a certain amount. We can, it can, for certain genes, it can hinder absorption by 35% to maybe 70% you know, of, of a particular nutrient. And then on top, um, and I know a lot of people mention this, but um, unfortunately, it is true from what I've seen clinically, is that a lot of us do have poor nutrient absorption from a digestive point of view. So, um, you know, a lot of people do have, uh, you know, lower hydrochloric acid, lower digestive enzymes, simply stress can do that for us. Um, but, you know, it's very common to have things like parasites as well. Um, I know it sounds gross, but it's true, you know. And um, so all of these things, like if we have a parasite, say, for example, and we're not necessarily getting any, I mean, it's very common to have parasites. You know, it can, depending on how the person's presenting, these, all of these factors play a considerable, um, you know, uh, impact on how we will absorb nutrients. And unfortunately... I hate to say it, that's why the, the supplementation is required these days, you know, because um, if we were to just to try to do it through food, uh, I don't know about you, but I would be very impatient and I would probably just give up, you know, with that. It's because you just feel so sick. Um, and so, um, you know, to begin with, it's just a way to bridge. Um, but also if we have poor digestion, it can also you know, hinder the way that we actually absorb these nutrients from our food as well. And, you know, just on kind of your question, Meg, just with, you know, how do we absorb these nutrients from food? Like some foods are actually anti-nutrient. So what I mean by that, it'll block the way that we absorb our vitamins and certain nutrients. So like iron can be blocked by black tea and by um, a, a natural chemical compound called oxalates, which are found high in like spinach and nuts. So, you know, it really does depend on the person's um, 
dietary habits and like looking at the overall picture and seeing, okay, maybe they're iron deficient, they have digestive issues and they're eating what they think is a really healthy spinach smoothie with lots of nuts in it every day. You know, so it's just trying to look back over these clues because it can all play a part, even sometimes in seemingly healthy, healthy foods. Okay, great. There's a couple of specific ones, but that actually are, you know, look relatively common. Um, what can ridges yeah. on the nails indicate? Uh, ridges. Um, I have seen that to be uh, linked sometimes to liver, uh, working with liver health, um, and also silica, the mineral silica. Yeah. Um, there were actually a couple of questions around um, the Epsom, uh, Epsom bar. Salt. Yeah. Um, some specific ones, which actually, you know what, there's a couple so of very yeah. specific ones. So we'll follow up on that one. We can, um, we can uh, maybe send an email out with some instructions. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of questions on a good multivitamin brand for women yes. and tween age kids. So we will definitely cover that and send that out afterwards. Yes. Um, I think we'll give you a couple. I think we've got a couple in the clinic, really good multis for different ages. Um, a question around the DNA testing. What protection is there for the info? Yes, that's such a good question. Actually, I should have touched on that. So thank you for whoever asked that question. I only use one DNA company in the clinic. Um, a lot of people may be familiar with um, 23andMe. Um, I would never use a company uh, that, that, you know, your privacy would be sold on. So this is a private company. All of your information is kept 100% private. Um, it's not as cheap as 23andMe, uh, but the reason behind that is because is because of the quality they, they um, also they actually uh, genetically they test every gene twice so there's you know there's more accuracy in it and as I mentioned before it's a once-off genetic test so you want to make sure that it's accurate as can be um, and it's because it's a once-off test as well. Um, question from another uh, lady here is there a correlation between leaky gut and inflammation? Definitely so, definitely. Actually, the bacteria that live in the mucosal lining of our gut is extremely sensitive to inflammation. So, you know, simply adding things in like omega-3 is a very safe thing for most people to add in unless they've got some type of seafood allergy or something. But um, omega-3 is actually very easy to add in. And then, um, yeah, leaky gut, definitely reducing inflammation, probiotics, these types of things, gelatin. It all has to be slightly individualized. You never know if someone's vegetarian or not as well. So you can change things depending on how they are. There's a marine collagen actually, which is really good. So I could possibly. Alicia that. gave a great um, webinar a couple of months back, um, which actually we can, it's on our YouTube channel, just around sort oh, yes. of, um, <laughs> this whole area of gut. And I know there were a lot of questions at the end around leaky gut and inflammation. I forgot about that. It's probably a good tip. Um, so another one here, is there any connections to dark knees, elbows and cuticles and nutrient deficiency? Ah, that's a good one. Um, dark elbows and cuticles. It depends on how it looks like anything that's dark. I would be very careful with that. Um, like, you know, dark lines on the nails or it depends on how dark that actual coloring is. But um, and like how it has kind of come about. Um, but I, that is something that I would actually get checked out by a doctor, a medical doctor, possibly just depending, I don't know how, you know, common it is like how for this person or how it's come about, but consider that. Um, something that we probably are all hoping what your answer might be. What is your take on some studies that show a little bit of caffeine a day is actually good, say oh. one to two cups? <sighs> okay. Everyone's going to hate me for this. I don't think caffeine is very good for anyone, really. And I know I'm never going to get a job at Starbucks now for that. But um, I think that what happens is, is um, the caffeine, I mean, there are genetic SNPs you can look at as well, as far as your ability to metabolize caffeine, like how sensitive you are to caffeine, how quick you would absorb it, this type of thing. But even for people that aren't as sensitive, um, it's running on nervous energy. And so that will end up kind of contributing towards more adrenal exhaustion and the likes. Some people can get away with just one cup a day, but I find that caffeine is quite addictive. So what ends up happening is people tend to have more stronger 
it's even if they're not having more, it's a stronger cup of coffee. Um, and some of those cups of coffee can be quite strong. I just think it really, it actually does burn through a lot of your, if we're just talking about it from the topic of today, it really does burn through your nutrients a lot quicker. Definitely B vitamins. You'll zap through your B vitamins very quickly. Um, magnesium is gone in a flash. Um, and it puts your body in more of a hardened energy where your muscles are quicker to get sore and tight and tense. Locked jaw. It's just caffeine. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question about testing. Do you do yeah. fam fam familiar hyper cholesterol testing? Not at this stage, no. Yeah. Oh, a couple of new messages have come in. Um, yes, question around brands of vitamins and supplements on the market. We will provide that. Um, how often should I get blood work done to have vitamin and nutrient levels checked? Well, it depends on your outcome. Hopefully, if, you know, um, if you're looking at implementing, um, like if you get a nutrient deficiency, um, I would maybe look at retesting um, every three to six months. Um, but, you know, you may not necessarily, like if it comes back and it's all within the right range, then you don't, you know, maybe once a year. And it depends on like how stressful the last year has been. So you've got to take all of that in consideration. You know, if you've been sleeping well, how much coffee you've been drinking, all of these types of things. Um, what about the benefits of green tea? Does that mm -hmm. outweigh the small amount of caffeine it contains? Green tea is definitely um, a lot better, uh, a lot less caffeine. Sa same with black tea. So it's a good bridge sometimes for people. It's um, less impact. Um, but I would say for some people, even that caffeine could be, even though it's got the antioxidants in there, it depends. Some people are more sensitive than others. It could be enough just to consider that the caffeine in there, you know, a good way to test it and, and don't take my word for it is if you go, if you're having green tea every day and then you stop and you get any type of headache or extreme fatigue, then, you know, you're getting slightly addicted to it and it's good to have a break, not to use it as a crutch. Um, one question around, are there certain types of iron that absorb better or is an iron infusion a better way? There are definitely, I mean, iron infusions are quickest, um, no doubt. Um, but there are certain forms of iron that are better absorbed than others. Um, iron bisglycinate is one that's quite a, uh, a good form of iron to absorb. But the thing is also there's tips like taking it away from caffeine, like black tea and things like that, that can block absorption as well. Okay. Um, if you suffer from eczema, is there a specific vitamin that you recommend as a supplement? Definitely vitamin D. Um, I would be checking my vitamin D, level, D levels first. Um, and I would be more looking at the gut as well. So not just nutrients, but probiotics and things like that. Um, this is an interesting one. Do CT scans affect the body and affect absorption of nutrients? How often can we do a CT scan? Oh, that's a good, good question. Um, I'm not really qualified to answer something like that. I think, I mean, if you really need us, I mean, obviously we want to try to limit those types of scans as much as possible, but you know, when they're necessary, they're necessary. So, um, you know, I would just be making sure that if you're going in for a scan, if you're worried, you could definitely take, um, we were talking about like the oxidative stress side of things, you could take antioxidants um, before you go in to have a scan. Okay. Um, so a sleep one, I have insomnia, waking up, and, mm. waking up in the middle of the night. What supplements would you recommend to improve quality of sleep and to stay asleep? Um, so you could definitely look at all your nutrients and magnesium, if we're looking at vitamins and minerals would probably be the top one, but just a tip in general, what I would say is sometimes it's not just the one thing that's going to help. It can be a combination for sleep, just depending on how chronic it's been. And I definitely would say the more that you can help someone with their energy levels through the day, the better their sleep will be at night. So it's not just about kind of quickly taking something at night to help, but if we can also, I mean, obviously we need to take something at night to try to get to sleep, but also not ignoring the fact of, you know, really trying to build up the body during the day as well. Well, um, we've got a, a 
sleep therapist in the clinic who has yes. put together these um, sort of seven hu- sleep hygiene tips. So we will yep. we'll send that out as well. Um, are wow. the tests are the test procedures the same for kids and adults? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, and then how about acne in teenagers? Apart from diet, which supplement would you recommend apart from zinc? Um, so, yeah, definitely zinc is the top one, as you've mentioned. But I would also say if we're looking at acne, it would just be good because you can't always assume that they're not going to be low in these other things that could be contributing. I find that teenagers can be low in quite a lot of vitamins and minerals because of like their high sugar diets. So you just want to do it like a, a, a very generalized one for them at the same time. Even like vitamin D can be really helpful for the skin and acne and um, hormones as well. And, you know, bringing down inflammation in the body usually helps. B6 is really helpful. Um, a question, obviously, we're very lucky living in Singapore with all the sun. So for vitamin D, is sunbathing at the weekend sufficient or um, <laughs> great question uh, or you know, looking at, you know, a, a sunny climate. Yes. Would you think we'd be getting the right amount of vitamin D or is that something? It's an interesting you know? one because nearly all of my patients are low in vitamin D, even when, mm. you know, in Australia, in a very sunny climate, you know, I just think that when, because vitamin D, yes, we get it from the sun, but it's, it's actually a pro hormone. It's not just a vitamin. So it, and it helps to regulate a lot of different areas in the body. So I feel that as soon as we start to be depleted, it's very easy for vitamin D levels to go down, even if we are getting adequate sun as well. Um, Like if, I mean, yeah. And the darker our skin is, the harder it is for us to get the vitamin D. Like there's a few different things to take into consideration, but, you know, I guess a lot of people might've even read with, you know, um, COVID, you know, that vitamin D is very helpful for the immune system and that for a lot of people, they're low in the, low, low in vitamin D levels. So that is a really important one. And you don't, there's not normally symptoms as such from that that you would notice. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. Um, This is a great question. I had the same one myself. Is the opposite (laughs) of vitamin deficiency something that needs to be checked, e.g. excessive B12 levels? And I think sort of piggybacking off the back of that, you know, with supplements, or I know you mentioned one of them, is there, are there any specific ones that we need to be worried about kind of overtaking? Yes. And that's why I say that's why the testing is put into um, into place, because just because someone is, you know, even, for example, like with the um, acne, just because they're having acne doesn't necessarily mean that they're low in zinc. You know, it could be something else. And, you know, if you take too much zinc, then it can throw out copper, like another mineral that we need that's also essential in smaller amounts in the body. So it's important to have it balanced. And that's why once we get them at an optimal level, we would then you know, work with through the diet. Um, because yes, it, excess can actually be more harm than under nutrients, like deficiencies. Okay. Um, what would you recommend for hormonal imbalance due to menopause? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I, I think you, I would need a lot more information around that. But I guess the point of this is, is that even if that is the case, I would still work and, you know, look at nutrient deficiencies and all of, you know, often a lot of people can be low in B12, which can definitely affect our hormones. So, you know, for that, obviously herbs and other, you know, modalities can come into play, which can be extremely helpful. Um, But I would still say it would be good to look at like fundamentally what's actually, what else is going on as far as all the essential vitamins and nutrients that we need to actually help with making those hormones in the body. Okay. Um, What can be done for overactive bladder? I would say overactive bladder. um, Well, like first and foremost, I found that to be very much related to the nervous system. So if you are very anxious as a person, or if you feel like you're running on nervous energy, you're more likely to pee a lot at night. Um, And your blood is very much connected to your knees. So maybe they have knee issues. But, um, you know, I wouldn't say there's any one necessary, necessary, like one specific vitamin that I found related to that. But I would be, without having any more information, I would be working more with their nervous system. So, you know, magnesium is one that comes to mind. And I would be trying to trace back 
what it is for them as far as that and if the nervous system is a problem for them um one hair right? vitamin d do you have to take it long term or can you stop after a while uh, vitamin d definitely doesn't need to be taken long term um i would because it's a fat soluble vitamin so we do store it in the body um so yeah you you wouldn't need to take it long term you would take it for a period of time depending on your levels um in the in a blood test okay anyone have any last questions for alicia oh yep here we go does it make sense to just take a multivitamin versus worrying about individual vitamins? I know that some vitamins are needed to support others. So does it make more sense to stick with a multi? It does, but if you have a nutrient deficiency, the multi isn't going to be able to treat that deficiency. So it doesn't, depending, I mean, there's lots of different brands. There's millions of different brands out there. But the whole idea of a multivitamin is just to give you small amounts of everything. Um, so you know, the multivitamin. And yes, sometimes if you have a nutrient deficiency, you need to take it in combination with other vitamins like cofactors in the body. Um, but yeah, it's just about getting the right amount in there as well. And you can play around with that. And that depends on the main concern and all of that and the issue that the person's actually having. So it's, you can make it, you, you tailor it to them and make a particular combination up for them. Um. Are there any vitamins that you would recommend for arthritis? Yes, um, again, vitamin D, which helps to regulate a lot of our inflammatory uh, cytokines in the body. So vitamin D, um, I would possibly look at B12, just depending on what type of arthritis as well. Um, folic acid, make sure there's enough folic acid. Um, and you know your omegas are normally quite helpful for most people um, for arthritis and I'd be looking at other signs for like magnesium deficiency as well from that point of view. And there's lots of herbs that are great too for, for, for those types of inflammation. Okay, uh, probably the last question. What's the difference between folic acid and folate? Um, so folate is what we get in our diet, so through foods. Um, and folic acid is normally like what we would have in a, in a vitamin supplement. Um, but then it's uh, converted into the active form of folinic acid. Um, so for some people, like normally I would recommend folinic acid um, for a lot of people, just depending on where their levels are at as well for that. Okay, there have been a couple of questions just around um, recommended doses. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard that rates of absorption of supplements is very low. Are recommend doses based on this or do they take mm -hmm. in that into account? What does the question say? Um, I have heard that rates of absorption of supplements are very low. Are recommend doses based on this? Or I, I think it's our recommend doses. Do they take this into account? Yes, I mean, most, most vitamins and minerals, like even a multivitamin, the actual amount that they're putting in there is really a tiny amount. Um, and it depends on the company. Sometimes, like you can get practitioner only supplements that do have normally higher amounts in there. And also they normally have like activated versions or bioavailable, these bioavailable versions of the vitamins um, in there. But for some standard kind of vitamins, yes, it's, it's extremely tiny amounts. And that's what can be very confusing sometimes for people because they, they feel like they already have taken it. They've already tried that. But but they haven't really tried it yet because it's such a small amount or they're not absorbing it properly. Okay. Well, I think uh, we've had some great questions. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you everyone Thank you, for everyone. joining us. Thanks um, for listening. You know, for the sp some specific questions that we haven't answered, we will follow up. Um, and I think the other thing, you know, um, we brainstorm a lot about ideas for talks, but you know, if there are kind of bigger topic areas that you guys would be interested in hearing about, um, let us know. Yes, we'd love to hear. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. That was very interesting. And thank you so much, Alicia. And thank you, Meg, for, for all of these interesting knowledge. I would certainly come and get my test. I'm very, I'm very uh, you know, excited to see what actually goes on in my body. So I'm definitely <laughs> coming over. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this morning. As we said, this video, uh, this 
it will be recorded. It's recorded. It will be uploaded on our YouTube channel and at City Osteopath and uh, Physiology's YouTube channel. So thank you so much. More questions will be sent directly to uh, to Alicia and Meg. Um, and yeah, have a great day and look after yourself, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.